you're saying to yourself, I'm unsafe, that vibrates out to the other. And so I'm not going to be vulnerable with someone who's saying they're unsafe. Your deepest need is love. And so is everyone else's. The tip is to love anyway, courageously put your heart out there and be the most loving person everywhere you go. You go do that. And what does it do? It sends a subliminal message to everyone present that you're safe. And watch what happens. If you play this game that I'm teaching right now, you will become a magnet. You will become a magnet. You are the sea of love and everyone's gonna come swim. And welcome to Torah Talks Chazak's Tuesday night program with a special guest. We have with us all the way from Eretz Yisrael, our dear friend Rabbi Yom Tov Lezer Baruch Haba. Welcome. How are you doing, Rabbi? Thank you very much. I'm doing great. Yeah, happy to be Baruch here. Hashem. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for uh, joining us on Torah Talks Chazak's uh, amazing uh, podcast. And we're going to be speaking about the possible you. Uh, but before we uh, do the topic, we get a little bit of background about the uh, Rabbi Yonto Glazer and the great work you're involved with. Sure. I grew up in Los Angeles. I was raised in a unique environment, a very, very safe and uh, affluent part of West Los Angeles. And there were there was no crime. There was no um, really anything to worry about whatsoever. And there was uh, more money than we knew what to do with, me and all my friends. And so... We were, um, I had the unique situation in my home that there were no rules either. So um, that having, having no limit, no border, no, no rules, no, um, no edge to life, you know, the, it set me off in a very, a very courageous way, a very courageous path. And um, I, I, naturally wanted to break down anything I could find to see if it was real, you know, because if you're raised with no rules, you just, you're looking for something real, you know, like where is the edge? And, uh, you know, it seemed like the only thing that was forbidden was that which you got caught doing, but it itself was <laughs> not necessarily wrong. And, uh, we were not raised in a very godly, uh, teaching uh, was more atheistic in style, very kind of like the progressive left today, but, uh, but in, you know, in its infancy, maybe. And, and that set me on an amazing trajectory of adventure. And so I was big into sports and you could see me on any given day, uh, skateboarding down hills, full speed, six pack of beer hanging from my fingers and uh, on my way to meet the friends where we would go surfing and mountain biking and um, and doing you know extreme sports and uh we taught ourselves how to drive when we were about 12 and we were driving our parents sports cars and i was racing by the time i was 14 i raced cars for seven years um i've been wow. in crazy car accidents you know i've been in every kind of situation that you could ever imagine i was in it and um but uh, what it did was it led to many amazing things. And, and, and also my first peace of mind, I think I ever had was when I got to Israel, I came to Asia Torah and they were very busy proving that there's a God and very busy proving that Torah was not man written, but rather divine. And, um, and I was just, First of all, I was really excited to find out that the Torah is actually true. But more than anyone else, see, everyone else had had a serious sacrifice of lifestyle to find out Torah was true all of a sudden. That was a major lifestyle shift. For me, it was also a major lifestyle sh switch, but there was a relief that there is an edge. And the edge isn't man-given because I never bought into the man-given edges. It was a God-given edge. And when I found that edge, I was like, I'm home. I'm safe, finally oh. safe. And I didn't have to go ride some 30 foot wave or jump off a cliff with a either cliff diving or with a mountain bike. I was, I was finally at peace. 
and there's actual ah. there's a divine edge and but i'll just tell you something funny that if you mix my personality with halacha you know so it makes for something very interesting which is a diok is that the 365 negative commandments which are the edge and the right. um and about thirty thousand halachas which are um which are you know how to keep those 365 but but what's happening is we have a divine system that tells us what not to do that's such a blessing because then you can be clean then you can be clean then you can be whole then you can be holy then you can be be at peace then you can you don't have to second guess yourself you don't have to i mean if you're really ocd you can second guess how you say shema and stuff but as long as you sh said shema with some kavana you're you're in good shape but here's my deal with my personality my deal is that not only um Oh, if the, if God's saying what not to do with that list of 365, what's the diuk? <laughs> Everything else you should do. Uh. Go do it. Go do it. And when you get upstairs, Hashem's going to say, why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do the other thing? <laughs> you know, yeah. that wasn't on the list. Why were you being so afraid all the time? And I think all of this led, and then you asked about the seminar, all of this led to... Um, to the creation of a seminar called The Possible You, which really came about um, from, um, it was kind of a mixture of things. I think it wouldn't have come about. It had not been that my digestion was, uh, meaning my, my um, that I was basically heading for surgery. I could not digest food. My colon had completely given up on digestion. And it was all linked to like a stupid story from when I was a, 10 years old at my brother's bar mitzvah going to the bathroom and when a girl walked into the bathroom that was it and i locked the door and i cried and i missed the dancing and i missed the missed the pictures with the family like they actually don't have pictures of me at my brother's bar mitzvah because i was crying in the bathroom and it was like it was just such a weird thing you know it doesn't make any sense but something about that experience locked in a terrible terrible feeling inside my heart of being unacceptable and i went with that from 10 years old you could literally like watch everything i chose to do for the next 23 years in other words it took me 23 years to get out of that bathroom and when i and it, wow. what what did it take it took um getting called from the hospital to to um to um schedule my surgery to remove my kishkas at that point, I had to do some major soul searching and I got like, bam, that's it. It's from there. And next thing you know, my digestion relaxed. Next thing you know, I can like digest food and, and now all of a sudden I'm not lactose intolerant anymore and now I can eat, you know, everything I want. And, and immediately I took my Pirkei Avos class at Eishat Torah. So that, you know, I was teaching Pirkei Avos. I took the class, I told them, close your books, you're now in a seminar. And over time, it became the Possible Use Seminar. Yeah. Wow. I ran it for Grab free. My yeah. yeah. I ran it for free for three years. The first time I ever charged for it was I because Aish said, Who are all these guys? It was all like Mir Yeshiva guys. <laughs> Who are all these guys at the your, <laughs> in our building? So I they said, Get this out of here. So I, I rented a hall. It was the first time I charged. I rented a hall and I divided up the price of the hall to the participants. Because I was in a Vrech Kola. I learned full time for eight years, three star a day. And I didn't need any money. I was, I had like two kids and I just, you know, and then I had three maybe. And I just, I didn't need money. I just wanted to help people. And that's how I live today. I don't, I'm not counting the money. Any profit of the seminar goes right back into the seminar. Now there's like 75 people working for it. And uh, we're in, we're in uh, five cities. Uh, we have five centers. And then we do satellite ones. Like, for example, I was up in the country two weeks ago in Monroe, which is a satellite, not one of our centers, but maybe it will be on it. Wow, amazing. Okay, so so that's, that's what we're going to be story. talking about, the possible you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. Very, very interesting. <laughs> so, uh, Rabbi, often uh, one is stuck in their fixed mindset and can see beyond themselves to their true potential. So how does one see their true inner potential, Rabbi? Uh, um. You know, I don't think we can ever see it, our, our true potential. Um, 
because uh, the true what happens is in in life is you have the things you do like you and i are meeting right now on this podcast in this tour talk and but then you have your being and you know rabbi you have a an essence and i have an essence and it's it's way beyond what we're doing so there's doing and there's being so there's what we're doing we're on the podcast together and now I'm, now i'm drinking <laughs> but who am i who am i being and what happens is we get this chatzitza barrier to who we're being from the development of our lives as children and of course our parents can't like fix it for us meaning if you have negative statements of being like i am no good or i am unloved or i'm unwanted or i'm invisible or i don't matter or i'm incapable or i'm lost or i'm small or i'm weak or i'm a nothing or i'm not good enough or i'm not as good as someone else all those things who's going to help us with that it's not like we're announcing it to our teacher in school we don't come home that day from school let's say kid got uh, rejected from a game you know like they didn't pick him for the team or she didn't get picked for the show you know they don't go home to their parents and say oh mom and dad guess what i discovered i'm a loser <laughs> no one does that you know guess what i just found out i'm i'm unwanted you know no one does that and and now that becomes the being now is that really the being no the being is the that's inside of every human and that being you can how can you ever know what that is we don't know what it is which is another reason why we've got to be so careful with the negative commandments because you aren't you you aren't you so oh you think you should be doing that <laughs> who are you to say what you should be doing because you're you're e e you're enormous your 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 soul is so beautiful that if we saw the potential of it we would all turn white we would all faint we would we would we'd fall on our faces in front of every single person if we could see who they actually are and the, and the difference between wow. someone who has clean, beautiful vibration is just how much they've uncovered of their truth. And uh, so someone who's, not, someone who's not getting great results in their life is someone who's got a lot covering up in their, on their being. Now, I'll, I just got to share this with you, Rabbi, that there's a second chatzitza. Sure, there's a second chatzitza. There's two chatzitzas. There's probably more, but there's two we need. Two barriers. Yeah, two major, sorry, two major barriers. So barrier one, we said, was when there's, um, you know, like a film on their being, like a cover-up, uh, a um, a barrier, we'll call it. And we have a term for it. In, yeah. in the seminar, it's called the inner negative belief. Inner in that you yourself aren't even aware it's going on. Negative is that generally we, were, we think more of our negative experiences in our development sadly but you know think about it. if you have 500 great days and on day 301 something goes wrong if i ask you a couple years later which day do you remember of those 500 days which one do you remember 301 yeah that's the day that was the defining moment and it's just the way humans are sad you know because it's crazy you know 499 good days is like should outdo that one <laughs> that one mishap but I myself was a victim of one mishap and more than one, actually. They, you know, you, we, we all have probably about 20 inner negative beliefs. It's inner. It points to the negative. And the last is it's not even true. It's just a belief. There's no negative statement a human being can say about themselves. So that's true. You know, I, someone always raises their hand in the seminar and says, what, there's no such thing as a dumb person? And I said, yeah, well, I guess, yeah, there was one dumb person in my class. They now make about a quarter million dollars a job. Wow. And I'm like, they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, the guy was an absolute idiot. He couldn't pass any of his classes. Um, no matter what subject we gave him, he failed. Um, <laughs> but when he was a little kid and his parents ever took him to, you know, a hotel or any type of place like that, the kids in some hotels, he would start screeching and grabbing his head and, and like, get me out of here. And the parents would have to rush him out. Anyway, he gets a quarter million dollars a year to, to um, design hotel lobbies, a, a job, quarter million dollars a job to 
do hotel lobbies. He's a, like a world's genius in interior design on the high level stuff. Like lobbies are very expensive. And the, and <laughs> you understand the guy's a genius. And Albert Einstein, who everyone thinks of when they think of a genius, the guy couldn't ride a bike. He couldn't even get himself dressed. He had a, he had the same exact outfit, seven of them. And it just had a date on the hanger and he would take the clothes off the hanger and put it on. He wouldn't be able to get himself dressed. Couldn't ride a bike. Um, you have people who are spatially brilliant. You have people who are numerically brilliant. You have people who are spiritually brilliant. You have people who are socially brilliant, which is probably my brilliance, by the way. <laughs> I'm very good with people. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Anyway, please here. We didn't get to the second barrier though. We should probably mention it. Yeah. The second yes. barrier is is personality um personality moves that we make that no one should know about the first barrier. You understand? So mm. so for example, if I saw myself as a loser, I might create a personality of being cool. If I saw myself as, uh, you know, unacceptable, I might show up as a, as an Oscan, as a, uh, you know, a, how do you call that? Uh, the guy in charge of everything, you know, so everyone, you I don't know, know what the English translation of Oscan is. Yeah. <laughs> the doer, the one doer. that makes things happen. The guy who makes things happen in the community, that's the Oscan. And so, you know, if I, if my first barrier, the inner negative belief was, let's say, unwanted. So I become the Askan, which I'm sorry, there's no English for that, but it's the guy everyone turns to for whatever they need to happen. But, but here's the thing. Here's the amazing thing in the possible you. Is we don't take the Askan and tell him, you know what Askan stands for? Ask him. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but if, you would think that someone would do the seminar, they're going to find out, hey, wow, I became this Askin, or I became cool, or I became the Joker, or I became entertainer, or whatever. Um, and you might think we're going to take that away from them. No, he became a great Askin. That guy's amazing. But what happened before is he was ignoring his wife and kids. He was uh, working crazy hours, so he was ignoring his own health. He was ignoring his diet. And and he was, uh, and he was uh, kind of like, you know, keep your hands and feet away from his mouth because he was a little rough with the community as he was busy with millions of requests. So all of a sudden, the Askan becomes the sweetest honey. He's going home to his wife and kids. He's taking care of himself. He's eating well. He's got a couple of underlings now that can handle some of the other jobs that he doesn't have to do absolutely everything. And you understand what the difference is? And and the Amazing. Joker, the Joker, get him up at a Shevabrachas, let him tell his jokes. But it's but he know he doesn't have to be the Joker. He chooses to joke. He chooses to do that. <clears throat> you get okay, so you got the idea. So the first barrier is called the inner negative belief. It's just a belief, it's not even true. And the second barrier is we call in the seminar, it's kind of rough to call it this, but we call it the survival strategy. And that's the mm. personality that we use to um to compensate for the inner negative belief but it is exhausting it exhausts us it exhausts our loved ones it's hard to work with such a person you know you're just waiting for the meeting to end to get away from him you know because his energy is all cluttered up wow but if you want to go deep wow, wow, wow. this is a torah talk is yeah let's do it there's, there's a well there's a deep question is why did god set up that the development of a personality has to come this way because it comes this way for absolutely everybody no, show me anyone who didn't develop their their skill sets their personality their show me anyone who didn't develop this way i've never met anyone what's no. shot what's what's the reason uh, that god created it this way ben that's it's a good question mm, it's the million dollar question it's a good, it, first of all, <laughs> it's nice as parents because your kids are going to develop this whether you like it or not. And that's how they'll develop their, their, their personality and skill sets. So um, why did God set it up that way? I don't know. You see that God was creating the world in kind of weird ways. 
you know, like for example, having people live up to a thousand years, <laughs> he saw, he saw that they were really taking their time on their way to heaven and that wasn't good for them. And he switched it around to 120, you know, in the time of Noah. So it could be that this was like part of that, part of our experiment, not that God's experimenting, but you could, it almost looks like he experimented with the the thousand year lifespan versus the 120 lifespan. So maybe he experimented with this way of development of personality. And he said, you know what? I don't have an alternative for these human beings. What else are we going to do? What's the alternative? Uh, but I'll tell you this. Here's another amazing Torah perspective. Is that, let's call my hand right here. Let's call this hand creation. Let's call this hand revelation and let's call this hand completion so we got creation revelation completion in other words creation that's like the davening shabbos night that's the energy of shabbos night revelation that's when the we read the prayer in the middle of the synagogue we read the torah which is the revelation of the torah in the middle of the synagogue it's like that little beam in the center is mount sinai the revelation, what's it revealing? It's revealing, it's called the Torah. What's Torah? Instructions. It's the instructions for life. Torah Chaim. Torah Chaim, the instructions for living. And then there's, you know, Mincha time of Shabbos, the afternoon of Shabbos, which is Ta'echad, Shimcha Echad. Everything's one. You are one. Your name is one. And who's like your nation, Israel? One nation. One, 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 meaning completion. So think about it. Everyone who is born is eventually going to die, right? That's the one thing we knew having children is that they'll be born, they will die. So we have creation of the child. We have completion of the child when they come to their death. When is the revelation? At what point do you have revealed to you your essence? Because isn't the Torah the revelation of the essence of this creation? It is the blueprint of the whole universe. And so... It very well may be that, that God set it up. And so you ask the question, and I'm telling you what my thoughts have been over the years. I, I don't have the answer, by the way. But could it be that, that, yes, that will be the genesis of one's personality, but there has to be a moment. There has to be a moment of revelation where someone finally gets to their soul. And they, they finally get to their soul and with a killer set of skills, you know, and a, maybe a great personality. And, and they, uh, they can now use those skills and, you, and, and enjoy that personality as a gift for the world for the rest of their life till they come to completion. Mitoch lo l'shma, bo l'shma. If at first you're coming not, with, not for the sake of, you know, truth, you can come to the sake of truth. Meaning, meaning if you do things for the wrong reason, you can come to the right reason. Powerful, powerful. True, 100% Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer. So, so Rabbi, one of the obstacles uh, that the possible you is addressing is fear of judgment of others, fear of overcoming challenges. How does one overcome these fears, Rabbi? So, so the way we break it down in the seminar is with five fears, okay? There's, there's five major fears, and any other fear you could think of, you could put in the categories of those five. There's obviously more than five fears, but, but you can put them in there. So the fear number one, like you just mentioned, judgment from others is the fear of rejection. That, and by the way, I'm giving them an order of popularity. This is the most popular fear for people is rejection. <laughs> they say, they say that, um, that that the fear of rejection sorry fear of public speaking is uh is is pulled to be greater than the fear of death which means if you ask someone if they'd like to speak they'd be like no you can just kill me <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway the fear of rejection is the number one fear which is what others are thinking of you number two fear excuse me a little itch number two fear is the fear of failure Fear of failure is, uh, you know, your personal performance. You know, yeah, that, that's that's a huge fear, just under fear of rejection. The and it can very much relate to rejection because are are you afraid to fail, or are you afraid to fail? Because what is everyone going to think? Which is the rejection. You get the you get that distinction. So it's like, 
Fear of failure can be very wrapped up with rejection, especially someone who grew up in a family where like there was a very high bar for, for um, success. And so they're going to have a fear of failure and rejection wrapped up. Fear number three is the fear of being controlled. Everybody answers to somebody. You know, some poor kid, I don't mean poor financial, but it could be poor financial, but some poor chap watches, you know, a Range Rover drive by his high school and he's like, you know, when I'll be a Range Rover driver, I'm not going to answer that. Nobody. Meanwhile, that Range Rover driver, he's on his way to his therapist. Why? Because, because he can't sleep at night because he's, all his investors are breathing down his throat for, you know, the profit share. And meanwhile, you know, the interest rates went up and he's answering to like, this Range Rover driver is answering to more people than that teenager could ever dream to be answering to. <laughs> you get the point. So that's that's the fear of being out, yep. of, con out of control. Fear. Which includes authority. That's fear number three. Yeah, which includes authority. It includes God. It includes rabbis. Askanim. Um, the fear of uh, parents, uh, in-laws, father-in-law, you know mother-in-law especially if she's hungarian and um <laughs> anyway the i work with a lot of hungarians it seems and i'm also from there so is my wife but somehow god brought me to heal the hungarians although we get plenty of polishers in there too in Sfaradim. um anyway <laughs> the uh, the where are we holding oh fear number four Sorry, I brought the fear number four out. Yes, yes. So fear number four is very general. It's called the fear of the unknown. And that's um, that's your general courage going towards the future. And people don't like the unknown, you know. People people prefer many more givens. Um, uh, the unknown is like really an enemy to a lot of people. And, it, and you know, it's obviously a very big industry with uh, creating calendars and itineraries and like how much can i somehow move the unknown into the known without actually getting there <laughs> you know my rebbe uh the hornersteipler rebbe uh of shalom shachna friedman he's he, I, I, we're we're pins karlin chasidim the pins karlin rebbe but my more over the years is a great 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 torah scholar and real hidden tzaddik and he um holy man he he, we used to speak to him, you know, it's like the day before the first night of Hanukkah, or, or it's like the day before Rosh Hashanah, and we're meeting, he's teaching the, the, the Chabura, it's a group of men, and we'd say to him, Rebbe, can you teach us something about Hanukkah that starts tomorrow? And the Rebbe would say, come back tomorrow. And what he meant by that is, is that, he so lives in the moment that he has no he has nothing to say about Hanukkah because it is not Hanukkah when it's Hanukkah come back and sit in the dust of my feet and I will teach you about Hanukkah and whoa you could sit there for five years if Hanukkah was five years long he wouldn't stop talking Hanukkah and and you understand like so he's the he's the epitome of living in the moment, whereas the rest of us are doing everything we can to like let that future, that unknown future, to start to make that unknown future the known. And however much it can't be known is a source of anxiety for so many people. Anyway, that's fear number four. And yeah, and we just bust that. We bust that one to smithereens on the last day of the seminar. And the, um, and the fifth, fifth fear is uh, the only kosher fear. It's the only one that's kosher. Did you know we have a kosher fear? It's the fear of... You're at Hashem, fear of heaven. <laughs> that's definitely a kosher fear. Um, yeah, the, the one kosher fear that we have, meaning of this world stuff, is, um, is the fear of physical pain and suffering. Yeah, which can include death or any phobia or anything, but it's the fear of physical pain and suffering. Why is it the kosher fear? Because you better have a fear of physical pain and suffering or you're going to be burning your hand on everything. You know, you're going to be 
uh, you know, I'm not going to get in a car with you if you don't have a fear of physical pain and suffering. You know, the, the way I like to say it is, who would you prefer drive you from Brooklyn to Muncie? Uh, an 18 year old or a 36 year old? You know, I'll take the 36 year old, please. You know, more experience, many more stories, close calls, fender benders. You know, he's got a nice fear of pain and suffering, whereas the 18 year old thinks he's going to live forever. When he crashes his car, he thinks it's a video game and he's got four more ships. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, anyway, the that's the that's the fifth fear. So you ask the question, how do we get rid of those fears? So right. the so here's the amazing answer. You ready for this? This is cool. And, and ready. we're ready. And, and I save people a lot of time with this one. Don't try to get rid of the fears. <laughs> Don't try to get rid of the fears. First of all, uh, how you deal with fear is courage. Courage is the answer to fear. Courage. Getting rid of a fear is, it's just going to be there waiting for you. Even if you try to get rid of it, it's there. We play psychological games with it, but there it is again. The... The answer to fear is courage. So let's say I'm afraid of getting up to speak publicly. Courage will be helpful now. Maybe I'll do it anyway because I will use this muscle called courage. And if I'm afraid of failure and I'm going into a business meeting where I really think that I'm out of my league with these people and I don't know if they're going to really buy my proposal, how about some courage? I'll go in there. With, I'll be courageous. I'm going to go in there with courage. And when I'm dealing with authority, I'm going to go with courage. See, people make this terrible, miscon they have a terrible misconception that when you see someone acting courageously, you think while you're watching, you're thinking, how is he not afraid? And the answer is, if he wasn't afraid, he wouldn't need courage. Do you need courage if you're not afraid? If you're not afraid, you just do it. No, he's, he is afraid. He's being courageous. He's overcoming his fears in a sense by being courageous. Yeah, the fear is there, but he's going for it anyway. Fear is is feeling the fear and doing it. I'm a surfer, you know. I've ridden waves like, I can show you waves like, you know, off my phone right now. You know, There's a, you want to see a twenty? You want to see me on a twenty five footer? So, so you know, I I I grew up, I grew up from the earliest ages that of everything in the world that you could be afraid of. And it's just a matter of courage. It's a courage issue. Here, I'll courage. show you. Here's a twin. Courageous. Here's a big one. I don't know if it'll focus on it. Can you, it's not. That's, that, that's you on it, Rabbi? Yeah, that's me up there. Can you see it at all? Cool. That's <laughs> a really high wave. Yeah. Anyway, the um So you were you had fear doing that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like and yet twenty your courage. Yeah, you know where I was on that wave? I was I was um about ten miles into the ocean off a off a big rock mountain. I was dropped off by a boat. It's not like I can get to the rock mountain or that would be even helpful to be on that rock mountain. I have to get back out to get to, back to the boat. And, uh, and underneath the ocean wasn't sand. It was gigantic boulders. Meaning, meaning if you fell the wrong way, you could be under one of them. You, you'd be like, or into one of them. You know, it was gigantic boulders, which means the, and there were dark boulders. So, so the sea was pitch black when you were underwater. If you fell on a wave. <laughs> Yeah, pitch black, and and now you're you just got in a washing machine, like the worst washing machine you ever could be in, and it finally releases you, and you can't even open your eyes to check which way the bubbles are going because it's black under there. You know, just to know which direction to swim to try to get some air. You know, and they, but you know, are you get you get reflexes after enough years of it and do the right things when you're in it. Today I was in full body armor. Just like a couple hours ago, I have some full body armor, full face helmet, and um, my equipment's right behind the curtain here. And, um, you know, and I, going down terraced, super steep mountains in Jerusalem, 
that you know, that to, you can't even walk down some of the things I was going down. You'd need ropes to walk down, and and so. But again, I'm I'm not crazy. I just have years and years and years of experience. So my muscle memory does it by itself. I don't even think. In fact, if I'm thinking too much, I'll take different trails. I won't do those trails because I need to be in my instincts, not in my head. When I'm in my head, I take some trails. When I'm in my body properly, I'm truly embodied, then I can do the radical trails. But listen, what I wanted to share with you is, is that there's another way to deal with fears that is so powerful. You ready? Let's hear it. Yeah. So remember how earlier we spoke about the barrier on being called the inner negative belief? That's the source of the fear. So let's say I, I have a fear, let's say I have a fear of rejection. And, but the barrier, that inner belief is that you're, I'm a loser or I'm unacceptable or I'm, I'm uh, um, unwanted or I'm unlovable. If any of those are the inner negative belief, well, you bet I'm going to have a big fear of, f fear of rejection. I'm going to have a terrible fear of rejection. You get that? So yeah, it's all connected. Right. So that's the source. So instead of, so instead of being busy with trying to deal with fears, you know, like for example, like uh, there's an amazing seminar called Carnegie, Dale Carnegie, where they, you get up and you break your fears with lots of public speaking in front of the group. And, you know, and uh, you're going to be right back a month later. You're going to be back to all your stuff because if, you, if the real issue was that you see yourself as unlovable or unliked, so then who cares that you busted through your fear of public speaking during that week? A month later, it's going to mean nothing. You know, so, so when you go, and this is what the possible use specializes in, is you go, when you go into the inner negative belief, and you expose the survival strategy, which is maybe to be shy for, be shy or, or be the over, you know, over the top, you know, attention vampire seeker, attention seeker. By going into that, you're able to expose it. I like it to the good muscles, like a card game. You know, you're holding your poker cards. Every card game, you don't want people to see your cards. That's the whole game, no matter what game it is. So here, you're holding your cards. Everyone keeps their cards close to the chest, right? Except with inner negative beliefs. Our cards are so close to the chest, we ourselves can't see it. What's the outer? <laughs> what's the outside of the card? What's the outside? That's the part everyone gets to see, right? That's This is what I'm going to let you know about me, that I'm shy and stay away. Or this is what I'm going to let you know about me, that I am God's gift to socializing. socializing. Yeah. Um, this is who I am, the overachiever workaholic, or this is who I am, the procrastinator, you know, bum. And that's the outside of the cards. But in the, in the possible you, we have this moment where we do something called an Emmis talk. It's called the Emmis talk. So I guess the Sephardim in the room have to play Ashkenazi. Emmet. Emmet talk. Emmet talk. So the Emmis talk is when you take your cards and you put them on the table. And you're just like, I'm calling my own bluff here. You don't have to have that with anyone. You can just do it personally, like privately in yourself. It's a process. And, and this is what I've been saying about myself, to myself. This is what I've been telling everyone else about myself. That's the outside cards. I'm putting them on the table. And guess what? Then you go wind up at some event and they say, can you get up and say a few words? And you're like, you got it because hey why not you know i'm here to i'm here to express i'm here to you know we're called human beings in torah called midabers we're called speakers expressors and so if someone asks you if you'd like to speak in the old days it used to be like oh i don't even know what i would say now you just get up there and do it you know or the other guy who always gets up to speak but he like sucks everyone's energy out and he's like, uh, you know, he's exhausting to, to, in how he draws everyone's attention every second. You see those guys when they're like, uh, 
you know, doing their little YouTube short or Instagram. They're like way over the top the whole time, just in case you might stop paying attention, you know. And I've called some of those guys who are friends of mine, influencers that are friends of mine. I've said to them, like, you can use that voice maybe once every two minutes for one line. But, you know, you don't need to do that. Like, we, we're listening. You know, but again, they're not, those aren't Pospu graduates, most of those guys. But you see, when a Pospu graduate, Pospu. what? Possible you graduate. Well, they graduated the whole uh, course. Yeah, they're called graduates. We're having our graduate Shabbaton coming up. I have a Jerusalem seminar Amazing. soon, and uh, and I'll be in. I'm I, I, the five satellites are London, um, Jerusalem, obviously, and uh, we have uh, Lakewood. Where are you, Rabbi? Where are you located? Queens, New York. Queens. Yeah, they, they want to bring us to the five towns, you know, eventually. And anyway, we have okay, uh, so Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn and Muncie. You know, I, I once did a, one in the five towns in Long Island. And uh, guess what happened? It was really funny. Um, what happened? Well, number one, what happened was we didn't market it properly. So people didn't really know in the five towns. So I show up there. I come into this mansion where we, we were being hosted. And... And guess who's in there? It's all like very, very important rabbis from all over New York. None of them from the five towns. And you know what they were all doing there? They all wanted to do the seminar somewhere where they wouldn't have to see everyone from their local town. And <laughs> when they got in that room and saw the other rabbis, they were like, oh, no. <laughs> but we had we had such an amazing seminar. It was great. The the greater the Torah wow. scholarship of the people in there, and the more healthy normal they are, the power more powerful the work is. It's really for healthy. How, how does normal. one hear? How do we hear about the upcoming seminars, Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer? Yeah, and people like, can just uh, go to people can just go to rabbiyomtov dot com or or they can go to the dot org. Just launching a new website on thepossibu.org. Rabbi Yomtov dot com. Okay, sounds so exciting, Rabbi. Yeah. This is amazing. So, wait, Rabbi, what what is the greatest tip you could give to us uh, to achieve the possible you? If it will be one tip, obviously there's a whole seminar, but if it will be a uh, regular as they say, on one foot. On on one foot. I think it's, I think it would be to know that your deepest need is love. And, and it's also everyone else's deepest need. And because there's no way to know someone would reciprocate if you were to give your love, the chances are you're really guarding yourself quite a bit from uh, being exposed or vulnerable because you're not feeling safe enough to share your love and to have it with someone and with others. But because everything works vibrationally in the world, if you're saying I'm unsafe, like if you're saying to yourself, I'm unsafe, that vibrates out. It, re it goes straight out to the other. And so I'm not going to be vulnerable with someone who's saying they're unsafe. Imagine you see a big muscular guy who looks like he just got out of jail, big muscles, and wearing a black tight T-shirt. And he's, it's written on his T-shirt. It says, I'm unsafe. And he's walking towards you on, in, you know, Lower East Side. What, what, am I, what do you, would you do? You'd cross the street, like get away from the guy. You know what I would do? I'd give him a big hug. And I'd say to him, oh, brother, I'm so sorry. You're feeling unsafe. You're safe with me. We're all projecting unsafe. Where whatever it is, whatever that inner thing is, whatever that inner negative belief is, that's what we're projecting vibrationally. People pick it up. And so that, that's the one tip I'd like to give everyone is that to know that your deepest need is love and so is everyone else's. And the more you hold back, the more everyone else is going to say, I'm not getting vulnerable with someone who, who's, who's radiating a vibration of that they're unsafe. 
They they're miss they're not getting it. They, they they you understand? You get what happened here, Rabbi? You're chafing this. It's a very deep yeah. deep chiddush. It's a deep idea. But when you're feeling like you're not going to risk vulnerability because you don't feel safe, what you're putting out there is that you're not safe. So what's the what's? I didn't get the tip yet. This was all to get you to the tip. The tip is yeah. I'm... The tip is to love anyway courageously put your heart out there and be the most loving person everywhere you go. You go to an event, be the most loving person. At the event. You go to a business meeting, be the most loving person at the business meeting. Don't act like an idiot, you know, be normal. But, but make sure that you did not leave any location without having put your heart into it with real feeling and care and love and connection. Maybe use the word connection if love sounds like too much. But you come in there, everyone felt your connection. You go do that. And what does it do? It sends a subliminal message, which is a fancy word of saying subconscious. It sends a subliminal message to everyone present that you're safe. And watch what happens. If you play this game that I'm teaching right now, you will become a magnet. You will become a magnet. You are the sea of love and everyone's going to come swim. I do this. I walk into shul and you know what I think? I see so many people. I think to myself, I love every single person. I do this all the time. And uh, it, it, it gives you, uh, I don't even know what it is. I, I guess uh, it's the possible you. It makes you uh, possible. I, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100% Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer. And I feel through the screen. So uh, yeah. love this Torah talk. It's amazing. But we have a Minahag, a custom a uh, final message for our broader audience, Rabbi Yom Tov Blaze. There's so many gems. And we appreciate it. Okay, final message. All right. Um, um, you know, this whole time we've been talking about my seminar. And by the way, I have multiple leaders yeah. lead, leading it in different cities. I'm not the only leader of it. And there's about, as I said, like 75 people working there now with all kinds of professional coaching and developing a coaching school as well. Um, the final message. You ready for that this message? Insane. This is the message. The we're message is, is that we're all in a seminar, always, anyway. Whose seminar? Life it's God. is a seminar. It's God's seminar. Ah. We're all in God's seminar. And he's pushing. You, you know what we're doing to the poor people at the seminar? That's why you got to be a healthy normal to come. you got to be a strong, generally successful normal person to be in my seminar. If someone even has like, 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 remotely serious problems i send them for therapy come back when you're healthy you know because what we put you through is a simulated ordeal of personality and and identity so you got to be pretty strong to go in there to begin with to get the tear down in order to rebuild properly the um you know you got to be a strong person in there so what here's my the takeaway that i wanted to share with you is that we're all in god's seminar this is God's seminar. And he's pushing and punching and poking and, you know, and we're developing, we're developing, and we're developing, we're developing, and, and we're becoming greater and greater. But here's the issue. Life has sped up in the last years. You know, a couple hundred years, Industrial Revolution, the Enlightenment, the secularization, the all the technology. We don't have time for his seminar anymore. Meaning, by the time you would go through his seminar and work through the things you had to work through, your kids are already married, but you messed yeah. them. But you messed them up because by the time you got to the to the clean living that this, that God's seminar is supposed to get you to before you graduate, in other words, before you die, because the graduation of God's seminar means you died. So, <laughs> the by the time you get cleaned up. And we all know that we all, everyone has like a grandparent or maybe a multiple grandparents that like became so sweet at the end. All their fears and what anyone thinks are gone. They've noticed they all, they call it losing their filters because they'll say crazy stuff. You know, they just say whatever they want. Why are they saying whatever they want? Because they don't care anymore what anyone thinks. They've been through God's seminar. So you understand? So the thing is, is we don't have time for that seminar anymore. There's too much damage on the way relationships, marriage, business, neighbors, community members. Thank you. We don't have time for, your, for God's seminar. So God sent me and other seminar leaders out there. We, what we do is we take you for four days 
and create a simulation of life. So we can speed up the process of the cleaning out of things that just don't belong there. Yes, you don't need my seminar. They were going to go away when you turned 70. But you don't have time for that. People are counting on you. And it's irresponsible. And you want to know something? If, if someone could have 1% growth in this seminar, 1%, I'm off, I want them to get 100%. And I will spend every seminar and all my follow-up staff, we're doing everything to create 100%. But if you got 1%, it's worth every penny. It's worth every penny. You're worth every penny. And, and, the, you know, and, it, and the seminar is not cheap unless you're wealthy, and then it is cheap. But, if, it's, but it's not cheap for most people. And whenever they tell me that it's hard for them, I tell them, you're worth it. And I tell them also, and don't think you need 100% success. You get 1% of this. If you got to bump up your game by 1%, then you're obligated to be there. And I'd gladly hand back anyone's money who felt like they didn't get bumped up in a significant way. I'm not out there for money, that's for sure out there to help people, which is all I really do. <laughs> I don't have time to count the money. I'm either, I'm either, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just basically on airplanes every two weeks. So I sit on airplanes. Then I stand in front of people for two weeks. And then I get back in an airplane, come to Israel. I do get on my mountain bike. And then, uh, <laughs> then like, I'm all, I'll only be here for like a week before I start a Jerusalem seminar next week. Then I'll have a week off. And then I got Lakewood and then, you know, and then I got Muncie, and then another week off. It's like I basically take a week off sometimes. And Rabbi not... Yom Tov Glazer, <laughs> so inspiring. Oh, Hashem should give you koach to continue helping Am Yisrael, doing for the Jewish people, doing good things. Bezat Hashem, we should be zocher. We should merit that you don't come to America. We should come visit you in Eretz Hakodesh with the with the Geula. Man, to complete redemption. Please, Hashem, take us home. We want, we want to thank Rabbi Yom Tov Klezer for an amazing Torah talk. We had the possible you. Uh, once again, uh, we encourage everyone to check out uh, the rabbi's uh, site, uh, Rabbi Yom Tov, and uh, the, the the possible you, right? Yeah, and uh, dot org and the Rabbi Yom Tov dot com. Okay, the dot com and dot org. Okay, and uh, we want to thank uh, everyone for joining us for yet another amazing episode of Chazak's Torah Talks uh, with special guest Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, all the way from Eretz Kodesh in Israel. Uh, we are on eight thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time Tuesday nights. Chazak dot org slash live, as well as all the podcast players. And a special shout out and thank you to our friends at Torah Anytime for hosting our uh, Torah Talks. A special thank you to Daily Giving. A dollar a day goes a very, very, very far away. And, of course, all the amazing staff members, volunteers, board members, supporters of the holy work and the Chazak Revolution. We're forever grateful, and we really appreciate it. We want to remind everyone to get involved uh, with, uh, with whether you know, have a family member, a friend, a neighbor, uh, anywhere that have kids that are not in Jewish day schools, reach out to Chazak. We will do everything and anything we can to get them to a Jewish day school or at least get them to get a Jewish education via our after-school programs, Sunday school programs, teen speech programs, our youth center. So much happening. Great things are happening. And we want to do more. We're not satisfied. So make sure to reach out to Chazak. Dedications for future programs are always welcome. A suggestion for future speakers is welcome as well. Info at chazaq.org. Chazak.org slash donate as well. And uh, Rabbi Yom Tov Glazer, thank you so much once again. You're welcome. Everyone be Appreciate well. Appreciate it. Blessings to everyone. Amen, amen.